Hello, I am Naomi Speakman and I am co-curator of the exhibition Thomas Beckett, Murder and the Making of a Saint. And on behalf of the British Museum, I'm delighted to welcome you to today's event, Pilgrimage and its Enduring Power, which is presented in collaboration with the Open University. This is the fourth event in our series related to the exhibition. And if you haven't made our previous events, you can watch them all on the British Museum Events YouTube channel. And do also keep your eyes peeled for future events coming up. After this one, the next event is on the 30th of June, and it is a discussion with Professors Alex Bovey and Paul Binsky, Beckett, uh, Charismatic Cathedral and Sacred Storytelling. And I'll also take this opportunity to encourage anyone who is interested to look out for the book associated with the exhibition written by myself and my co-curator Lloyd De Beer. But we have a really exciting and packed event for you today. Before I pass over to our chair, Professor Anthony Bale, I would like to reflect briefly on the relationship between pilgrimage and Thomas Beckett. Pilgrimage is one of the central themes of the exhibition and uh, of course it's central to Beckett's legacy. Now Thomas Beckett was murdered on the 29th of December 1170 and very soon after pilgrims flocked to Canterbury in search of healing and also to visit Beckett's tomb in the cathedral crypt. We know that many of those pilgrims also reported miracles. They told them to the monks. Two of those monks, William and Benedict, wrote down what they heard. And over the course of roughly three years, they collated around 700 miracle stories, which is an astonishing amount. And we know that those early pilgrims came not just from Kent or even just from England, but from all across Europe. And that's something that continued throughout the Middle Ages. During that period, hundreds of thousands of people made the pilgrimage to Canterbury. And it's one of the most enduring aspects of Beckett's legacy today, which still continues. So on that note, I will pass over now to Anthony to chair proceedings. Anthony, over to you. Thank you so much, Naomi and thank you for the invitation to speak and chair this evening. My name's Anthony Bale and I'm Professor of Medieval Studies at Birkbeck and the University of London, right next door to the British Museum in Bloomsbury in the heart of our wonderful city. It's a great joy and delight to welcome you all tonight and to chair this panel where we'll be bringing you a rich and varied set of perspectives on pilgrimage across different times and places. And as Naomi said, pilgrimage really is at the heart of Beckett's cult and features in so many ways in the marvelous exhibition. Very famously, the pilgrims to Canterbury appear in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, who are on their way to St. Thomas's Shrine in Canterbury, but they never get there. But also pilgrimage is manifested in, around St. Thomas in terms of relics and reliquaries, pilgrim badges, miracles performed by St. Thomas and at his tomb, and in the kinds of material culture like stained glass, which was designed to enhance the pilgrims' experience of Canterbury Cathedral and to deepen St. Thomas's cult. So the format of this evening's event is that we have five speakers, including myself, and we're each going to talk for about 12, 13 minutes, and then we will have time for questions and discussion points from the audience. And please put your questions in the question box on your Zoom viewer. And I'm going to introduce all the speakers now, starting um, with me. I'll be talking about pilgrimage to Jerusalem and Rome in the time of Beckett. And then we will have Richard Carter from the Church of St. Martin in the Fields, talking about pilgrimage to Canterbury then and now. Then Marion Bowman from the Open University, talking to the title In the Footsteps of Pilgrims, Caminoization and the Refocusing of Contemporary Pilgrimage. And then Kaisra Khan, a curator at the Nasser Di Khalili Collection on Hajj and the Arts of Pilgrimage, talking about the Hajj pilgrimage to the House of God. And then Ima Ramos, curator of South Asian collections at the British Museum, talking on pilgrimage and politics in colonial Bengal, the myth of the goddess Sati. So I'm going to start by taking us back to the Middle Ages, to Thomas Beckett's time, 
and start with a story about a rather unusual figure, a woman called Margaret of Beverly. Margaret of Beverly was born in the Holy Land around the year 1160, so about 10 years before Thomas Becket's martyrdom. She was born to English parents in what we, call, what we now call the Crusader States. So this is the area in and around the Holy Land that had been settled by Western European Christians during the Crusades. Jerusalem had been, had been taken by the Crusades in the 1090s and had been intensively redeveloped as a Latin Christian city for its inhabitants and for visiting pilgrims. And Margaret's parents were on pilgrimage to Jerusalem at the time she was born. And little Margaret was brought back to England as an infant, where she seems to have grown up in the town of Beverley in Yorkshire, in the northeast of England. As a young woman, around the age of 20, Margaret returned to Jerusalem in the 1180s, shortly before the city fell to Saladin in 1190. And Margaret was there in Jerusalem during the siege of Jerusalem that was such a traumatic and decisive event, um, leading to the city once again becoming an Islamic rather than Christian city. After various trials and difficulties, Margaret made her way back to Europe, visiting the shrines of Santiago de Compostela in northern Spain and in Rome. And she visited her brother Thomas, who was a monk in France. And eventually Margaret herself became a nun in northern France. And around this time, Thomas wrote down his remarkable sister's life story, which describes the various pilgrimages she undertook and the miracles that happened to her along the way. Now, Margaret's story exemplifies how medieval people could travel very long distances in extreme and often very dangerous circumstances in the service of pilgrimage. And I hope I'm going to be able to show you a map. There we are. Um, here's a map of Europe as seen from England at the time of the Crusades. At this point, Jerusalem was considered very much the centre of the world, and Britain was really at the edges of Europe. It was a periphery. The world, through English eyes, was orientated towards the eastern Mediterranean, and it was in cities like Damascus and Cairo that there, were, um, there was a large population and a trading relationship that was that connected them to, to Western Europe. And these were cities of the kind that weren't known in Western Europe. So this is really Crusader Europe, Jerusalem, Acre, Alexandria, Constantinople, Cairo, where the center of the action was. Now, Margaret of Beverly was not a soldier. She was not a crusader, but rather she presents herself as a simple, devoted and austere pilgrim. And her story represents the growing importance in 12th century Europe in the time of Becket and in the kind of time of the, the um, development of his cult, the development of pilgrimage to holy places overseas. And in particular, it represents a kind of high point during the Crusades of Jerusalem, the earthly Jerusalem being a place that Western Europeans visited. Before this time, pilgrimage was common in Christianity, but it usually involved shorter journeys, not far from one's home, one might make a pilgrimage to a local well or spring or a holy mountain, for example, or to a shrine of a local saint to make an offering as an act of charity or atonement or for healing. But in Beckett's time, in the 12th century, we start to see the rapid development of mass pilgrimages, the establishment and rebuilding of entire cities as centers for pilgrimage, and the development of many new cults, including St. Thomas's, that partook of the spiritual and financial benefits of having a pilgrimage shrine in one's church. And so some of the most famous medieval pilgrimage sites like Bury St. Edmunds with the shrine of St. Edmund, St. Albans sign up with shrine of St. Alban, St. David's in Wales, um, Saint Denis near Paris, Mont Saint-Michel, um, St. Foy, St. Faith at Conque, um, Cologne, um, these are, significantly built or rebuilt as major pilgrimage centers in the 12th century. So um, Canterbury is really within that kind of um, moment. Now, pilgrimage to Jerusalem was inherited by Christianity from Judaism, which in the biblical period had three great pilgrimage festivals, Passover, um, well, Pesach, Pentecost, Shavuot, and the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot. And this was, these were periods when adult men were expected to make their way to Jerusalem to make an offering of prayer at the temple. So even by the time of Christ, Jerusalem was um, 
understood as a centre for place pilgrimage, but in this tradition was significantly reshaped by St. Helena, the mother of the Emperor Constantine. And around the year 326, Helena travelled to Jerusalem to locate the sites of um, Christ's life and death. It was Helena who identified the site of Calvary or Golgotha and found the true cross buried nearby. And this became the kernel of what quickly became the most precious site in Western Christianity, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Um, so um, what, I'm, what I'm showing you here is a map of Jerusalem in the Crusader period, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Similarly, pilgrimage to Rome developed out of um, Roman pagan traditions, and we know that Christian pilgrims were visiting Rome by about the year 200. The difference between Rome and Jerusalem is that pilgrims were visiting Rome to see places associated with the saints, that is, with post-biblical martyrs, whereas people visited the Holy Land and Jerusalem to visit the scenes and landscapes and specific places of the Bible. And by about 1200, the concept of three great pilgrimages for Western Christians had started to solidify, based on first, Jerusalem, where Christ had lived and died, second, Rome, as the seat of the papacy and the site of lots of the saints' martyrdom, and third, Santiago de Compostela, the shrine of St. James. So at this point, the pilgrimage to Jerusalem was still the most precious journey a Christian could undertake. And Jerusalem, of course, has a fundamental role in, in Christian history. We can see a shift in Beckett's lifetime at Canterbury from its own sense of its closeness to Rome to it being closer to Jerusalem, a kind of new Jerusalem. It styles itself as a heavenly Jerusalem in keeping with the confident and expansive and also militaristic view of the Christian world that the Crusades engendered. Before the 11th century, pilgrimage had tended to be restricted to two groups, the very rich or the very holy. But um, from 1096, this changed when the Pope issued an indulgence for the First Crusade, which meant that anyone taking part in the Crusade had their time that their soul would spend in purgatory reduced after their death in order um, as a kind of reward for taking part in the Crusade to retake Jerusalem. So the, pil the Crusades themselves were a kind of pilgrimage. The Crusaders didn't call themselves Crusaders. They thought of themselves as pilgrims and a crusade might best be thought of as a kind of militarized or weaponized pilgrimage. Pilgrims to Rome, on the other hand, tended to be less wealthy than pilgrims to Jerusalem and less involved, obviously, in kind of the spatial conflict that the crusade involved. And the trip to Jerusalem required more funding than the trip to Rome. But also, until about 1300, pilgrimage to Rome was a much more informal affair than the pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And here, this just gives you, um, it's slightly later than Beckett's time, it's from the early 15th century. Um, but what we see here is a um, kind of picture or map of Rome, which at this point was still a small city and its classical sites were largely broken down and ruined and many of its churches were in poor repair. And Rome is often talked about in this period as a kind of parkland for pilgrims. And you get that sense from this image. There's no, no houses, no streets, no shops. It's very much a place of either broken down ruins or of churches. So um, the evidence we have of who went on pilgrimages to places like Rome and Jerusalem is very patchy from this period. We tend to have records of kings or bishops or the nobility, but we don't have that many records of less exalted pilgrims. And Margaret of Beverly's story is known because of her brother's biography of her. But there were lots of provisions made for poor pilgrims in the form of hostels and places to get free food and shelter, and also in the records of communities um, clubbing together to fund pilgrims to Rome and Jerusalem. There's a striking incident from 1188, from just a few years after Beckett's death, which can be found in a letter written by the prior Honorius of Christchurch, Canterbury, Beckett's Cathedral, Canterbury Cathedral. Honorius describes how he traveled to Rome from Canterbury with five monks, all of them from Canterbury. And he wrote a letter from Rome to Canterbury describing how the other five monks had died, apparently of malaria, while they were in the city. And so some other monks were sent from Canterbury to Rome to find out what had happened. And by the time they arrived there, they discovered that Prior Honorius had also died. 
And this is very common in the, in the medieval period. We find that people who go on pilgrimage don't make it back. Dying on one's pilgrimage was actually considered a very holy death, a very good death. Um, and Honorius was buried in the Lateran church and the other monks were buried in churches around the city. So pilgrimage wasn't necessarily a holiday, but it was often very perilous. Um, and, um, sorry, I'm gone to the wrong slide. Um, there we go. Okay. Um, now, a Western European pilgrim to Jerusalem would undertake um, a tour of the city's holy sites, like in Rome. And many of these places in Jerusalem had been refounded or even invented during the Crusader period. And a kind of procession developed around these sites, the forerunner of the Via Dolorosa or the Stations of the Cross, which is a tradition that only became formalized in the 15th century. Pilgrims in the 12th century would have stayed in a hostel called the Muristan, which was run by the Knights Hospitaller. Um, and they went on trips around the city that were emotional and devotional rather than historical. The emphasis was on a kind of, um, was on weeping, was on feeling the landscape rather than testing its historical um, nature. They were seeing through the eye of faith rather than through the eye of historical facts. And pilgrims would often buy um, souvenirs. I've put a few on this slide for you um, and give you a sense of what the material culture of pilgrimage at this time might have involved. People record having ampules of holy earth or dust scraped from the holy sepulchre or um, scraping crosses into the walls. And some of them even seem to have had tattoos, um, which is how tattooing came back to Europe. Um, but the main thing for a sincere pilgrim would be to transform themselves internally by stepping in the footsteps of Christ. Um, and that was the kind of transformation that pilgrimage um, affected. Now, I'm aware of time running on, so I'm going to wrap my um, presentation up just with a few words about, about St. Thomas's cult and the men who killed St. Thomas, Thomas Beckett, and the role of Jerusalem in the afterlife of Beckett's cult. To absolve themselves of their murder, the four knights who killed Becket went to visit the Pope in Rome. And this itself was a kind of penitential pilgrimage and pilgrimage as a kind of penitence or penance was also very common. The Pope then commended them to make their way from Rome to Jerusalem, barefoot and in hair shirts. And this is a further kind of penitential pilgrimage where, in which they would suffer in the footsteps of Christ. And all four of them seem to have died there, um, either on their way there or once they got there. And various traditions sprang up around them. The dominant one being that the four knights were buried at the door of the temple in Jerusalem, the head of the knights, the, the headquarters of the Knights Templar, now the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And they are said to be buried there the present day. And so this seamlessly connects Canterbury with Jerusalem and by doing so connects St. Thomas's story with Christ. And after Becket's death, various stories sprung up that likewise claim the direct line between Canterbury and Jerusalem. One hagiographer, Benedict of Peterborough, tells us a story that a monk in Jerusalem foretold Thomas's death. In 1160, 10 years before Thomas was murdered, according to Benedict, a monk in Jerusalem asked a visiting pilgrim where he came from. The pilgrim said he was English. The monk shouted, oh, England, oh, England, how attractive England is going to be. The monk then asked the pilgrim if he'd ever been to Canterbury. The pilgrim said no, he hadn't. And then the monk cried out, oh, Canterbury, oh, Canterbury, how attractive it's going to be. There will come a day when people flood to Canterbury just as they go to Santiago, Rome or Jerusalem. So at different points in its history, Canterbury has been a new Jerusalem and a new, um, and a new Rome. And, at, and the point I'll leave you with is that both these places, Rome and Jerusalem, would have been intimately familiar to people in Thomas Beckett's time, both as imagined spaces they'd read about, that they'd seen in art, but also as places that a surprisingly large number of people had visited. Thank you. So I will hand you over now to our next speaker, to Richard. Thank you so much, Anthony. On the 29th of December, 1170, Thomas Beckett was murdered in Canterbury Cathedral. The spilling of blood in such a holy place 
was appalling, but even more so because he was the Archbishop of Canterbury and close to King Henry II, appointed Royal Chancellor in 1154 and consecrated Archbishop in 1162. But for six years, he'd become embroiled in disputes with Henry II. Thomas Becket had dared to question Henry II's attempt to curtail the church's authority. But if the church thought that this was the end of Thomas Becket, he was, of course, completely wrong. Within days of his death were stories of the monks who had dipped pieces of cloth into his blood. And by dipping the cloth into the blood, there was already stories of miraculous healings. One person in Canterbury told how when mixed with water, he'd given this draft to his wife and his wife had been cured by paralysis. That was only a few days after the death of, of Thomas Becket. One of the knights later confessed that he was so shocked by the horror of what he had done that he feared that the earth would open up and swallow him. Of course, today, uh, uh, more recently, T.S. Eliot wrote in Murder in the Cathedral, the blood of thy martyrs and saints shall enrich the earth and shall create holy places. And as we've just heard, of course, Canterbury did become a holy place. Now Beckett's death was quickly interpreted as a martyrdom and beneath his fine robes, we were told, uh, there was a hair shirt showing his simplicity that this person that everyone always assumed was so grand was in fact a man of great integrity and humility. It was only a couple of years later that he was canonized. And of course, the king himself went barefoot, did penance before the monks in Canterbury Cathedral. Canterbury Cathedral became the destination of hundreds and thousands of pilgrims making their way to Canterbury in search of those miraculous healings, in search too of relics, his blood dipped in cloth, or even parts of his body were put in reliquaries and uh, 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 became prized possessions throughout Christendom. Jewel-covered caskets and reliquaries were very, very valuable. Over the centuries, St. Thomas of Becket's popularity grew and became even more intense. And of course, it wasn't just the miracles at Canterbury that were important. It was also the journey, the journey to Canterbury. And Geoffrey Chaucer in the Canterbury Tales, written in the late 1300s, uh, tells the story of those group of pilgrims who set out that, as Anthony said, never actually arrive, a yeoman, a merchant, a shipman, a, par a partner, uh, the infamous wife of Bath with her uh, five different husbands, and all beginning at the uh, Tabard Inn in Southwark before they set off. Because one of the most important things about pilgrimage is not just arrival, but the whole process of getting there. The call, the sense that God is calling you to a transformation in your life, to a change, and that sort of planning and preparation for the pilgrimage. And then, of course, the setting off, the saying goodbye to those who are close to you and known to you. And then, of course, your fellow pilgrims along the way, if any of you have ever watched any of the films about the, the pilgrimages to Santiago, what becomes very evident, it's the relationship with those you meet along the way. And I've done that pilgrimage to Santiago too. It's the stories that you share, each person making the pilgrimage, perhaps for a special reason, a problem in their lives, a, a painful circumstance, a, a death or a grieving or a or a celebration, but something which has made that person set off on the journey. And then, of course, the shared trials and tribulations on the journey, the discoveries you make, the, uh, the pain and the wanting to give up and turn back, but the, uh, the way of trying to overcome all those difficulties until you finally arrive at the destination. And then, of course, 
there is what that means to you. The, the importance of arriving at that sacred or holy place. And each person will have a different response to that sacred place. And then, of course, the journey home. As you've heard, many of the early pilgrims never made it home. But if you do make it home, what is the story you remember? What is the story you share? Over the last 15 years that I've worked at St. Martin in the Fields, each year we make that pilgrimage from London, Trafalgar Square to Canterbury with a group of pilgrims from all walks of life. Many of those who come with us have known homelessness or are refugees from other parts of the world or have a special reason for making that pilgrimage. Some of them are still homeless and together we make the pilgrimage beginning in Trafalgar Square, then across to Southwark, Tabard Street, and then to Swanley, and to Aylesford Priory, and then to Charing, and to Boughton Aleph, and, and Chartham, and finally to Canterbury. And it takes us four days to get there, about 74, 76 miles we walk together. The wonderful thing about pilgrimage is that once you begin the journey, you're all equal. No one has a high status or a low status because you can no longer be judged by the size of your house or the size of your income. Straight away, the, the, the pilgrim who is the best pilgrim is the one who's ready to share, to help other pilgrims on the way, to recognize the needs and to listen to the needs of the fellow pilgrims. And of course, the stories of each pilgrim begin to emerge as you walk together. What are the things which are important? Well, you discover one another's gifts. You discover the generosity of sharing, sleeping in, in halls or wherever you can lay your head, often to the snores of other pilgrims. Um, learning the, the beauty of the simple things of life, the water you drink, the cakes that are a friendly parish has made for you on the way, or just when you feel like giving up the Mars bar that someone uh, passes to you to give you sugar to create the, the pilgrimage. Walking to Canterbury, I, I, uh, I described it in this way. I want to walk along pavements across the Thames and down the river, weaving through people of every nation and every culture to smell chicken and chips and furniture stores in Lewisham and see the kids spilling out of school, to be stared at while I cross roads and junctions with my fellow pilgrims, and to feel ground slowly freed from concrete under aching feet. And then suddenly you've left the city and you hear the song of the birds and you breathe outside air and you taste the rain and are quenched by it and you feel the wind that makes your skin burn with life. And you ache not from sitting, but from moving. And you begin to know the shape of hills by walking them, the rhythm of each step, walking life into place. Together we begin to see again, leaves and shades of green, softness of grass and the sting of nettles, hearing again, a world free of traffic and sirens, feeling the movement of the wind and the snap of branches and the grasses rustle, snatches of conversation, and then the sound and the wet of the rain. I want to climb stiles and negotiate clouds and clat cows and cross boundaries. And I want to be open to the lives of those I walk with, the stories of others from every part of the world through whom each one of us is enriched to see the generosity on pilgrimage of the human heart come out of hiding, to witness again the to and fro of human goodness, free, no longer valued for job or wealth or status, but valued for human kindness. And I want to arrive, to taste food in the bustle of hospitality in church halls and sandwiches and prayers and plates of homemade cakes and hot bowls of water to wash your feet in shepherd's pie and dark cups of well-brewed tea. And know that on pilgrimage, you have struggled, but together, 
a welcome where for once all the outside can come inside and what is inside can come out. And there is no difference between you because we are all pilgrims on the same journey. I wrote that in my book, The City is My Monastery, to try and capture the flavor of what it's like to walk that journey together. And of course, the arrival is special with the flame for Thomas of Becket burning in the east end of the cathedral, but also a chapel of martyrs, which for me is especially important. Because at Can Canterbury Cathedral, we also remember someone who was inspirational in the life of St. Martin the Fields, a man called Dick Shepherd, who believed the church should be a church with an ever open door and is buried in the cloisters of Canterbury Cathedral. He believed that homeless people had a unique gift to offer to everyone. And he believed that a church should be a place where people should sit down side by side, no longer divided by wealth, but where the love of God could be experienced by all. I also love Canterbury Cathedral because martyrdom did not end with Thomas Beckett. In 2004, seven members of the Melanesian Brotherhood on the other side of the world whom I was working with were martyred. They were put to death while working for peace, tortured and killed brutally. They brought peace to those islands in the Pacific through their death. As um, T.S. Eliot said, the, the blood of the martyrs is often the seed of hope. And those seven Melanesian brothers are remembered in the East End with a beautiful icon of the seven brothers. I remember at the last Lambeth conference when that icon was unveiled on the East End and the Melanesian Brotherhood led all the bishops from the Anglican Church up through the nave of the church, through the choir to that Trinity Chapel and then to the Chapel of Martyrs at the end where the seven brothers are remembered. And I, I looked round and I saw that about 600 bishops from the Anglican Communion were kneeling on the ground. I thought, why are they kneeling? Why? And I suddenly realized that these seven young men from the Solomon Islands who died, who were just simple fishermen, they were kneeling for them because they had inspired the whole church with a unity and a longing for peace. And I realized that the, the words of the Magnificat, he will pull down the proud from their thrones and lift up the lowly. Those words are not just words for Mary, they are still words for us today. And pilgrimage is possibly a way for lifting up the lowly, turning the world upside down, making us see that the last can be first and the first can be last. I want to end with a, a small piece of music and some pictures of this group of, of pilgrims that I have walked with walking to Canterbury.
Thank you. Hello, my name is Marion Bowman from the Open University, and I'm going to talk about the footsteps of pilgrims, communalization, and the refocusing of contemporary pilgrimage. Now, the Protestant Reformation theologically and physically dismantled pilgrim traditions focused on sacred places, wonder working relics, or indulgence earning shrines. However, And here I'm having trouble uh, with seeing my slides. I wonder if Jamie could help me out. Here we go. So the Protestant Reformation, as I was saying, theologically and physically dismantled pilgrim traditions focused on sacred places, wonder-working relics, or indulgence-earning shrines. However, despite the visually empty space where Beckett's once magnificent tomb stood, for many people, as we've heard, Canterbury Cathedral still exerts a great attraction. It still centers on its medieval status as a preeminent pilgrim destination, but Unlike their predecessors, many modern pilgrims are not drawn to Canterbury by saints and relics, but by the lure of walking in the footsteps of pilgrims. There are probably more self-identified Northern European pilgrims now than at any time since the Reformation. The modern explosion of interest in pilgrimage and pilgrim routes, particularly in traditionally Protestant and increasingly secularized areas of Europe is a quite remarkable and comparatively recent development. And while there are undoubtedly some elements of continuity, there is considerable change. New pilgrimage attracts an immensely broad demographic from walkers to Christians, including those of denominations which roundly rejected pilgrimage at the time of the Reformation, to assorted spiritual seekers, including pagans, to people who self-identify as being of no religion, and to people simply needing to take time out in the context of walking with intent, in heritage-rich and experientially enriching journeying. People whose worldviews experiences and aspirations are quite unlike those of medieval pilgrims are nevertheless feeling that they are heirs to them and that they are in a variety of ways walking in their footsteps. Various factors have contributed to this new or renewed interest in pilgrimage, for example, long distance walking paths becoming increasingly popular and people wanting to be in touch with nature for both environmental and spiritual reasons. However, much of the successful representation of pilgrimage can be traced to, to the Camino. As we've heard, Santiago was one of the most popular and significant medieval Christian pilgrimage destinations, ranking alongside Jerusalem and Rome in prestige, with routes leading to it through a variety of countries, including Belgium, France, Germany, Portugal, Italy, Switzerland, and of course, Spain. For Catholics, of course, interest in and pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela never entirely ceased. However, the revitalization and broader popularity of the pilgrimage to Santiago grew exponentially in the latter part of the 20th century, and most significantly after the way marked former pilgrim routes across Europe to Santiago de Compostela were designated a cultural route of the European Council of Europe in 1987 and a UNESCO cultural itinerary 
in 1998. Now, it's really important to acknowledge that there were political, cultural, and socioeconomic motives behind the considerable effort and investment put into the consistent waymarking along the various sessions of the Camino routes in the form of a stylized scallop shell, which was the traditional emblem of the Santiago Pilgrim. It was highlighting that transnational journeying and cross-cultural encounter were long-established aspects of European culture. And by presenting pilgrimage as cultural heritage, the Camino was projected as something beyond narrow devotional or Christian denominational confines. That said, though, the Camino's great advantage, nevertheless, has been the Catholic Church's infrastructure of pilgrim churches, accommodation, and accreditation, giving it all that feeling of authenticity and continuity. Pilgrims can obtain a credential, referred to as a pilgrim's passport, which is stamped daily, giving the right to stay in pilgrim refugees, or showing their credential on completion of the Camino, pilgrims are awarded a Compostela, a pilgrim certificate issued by the pilgrim office in Santiago. There are also pilgrim blessings along the routes, and the pilgrim mass in Santiago Cathedral traditionally celebrates the end of the pilgrimage. Now, undoubtedly, a feature of the modern Camino is that the journey, rather than the shrine of St. James, has become the focal point. As one Church of Scotland minister and Camino veteran told me, story sharing in companionship on the road is the real miracle of pilgrimage, not relics and holy wells. So the development of the Camino as a cultural route, its accessibility, and the huge upsurge of media interest in it all contributed to the rediscovery and reappraisal of pilgrimage as a multifaceted contemporary practice attractive to a great range of people, including those without formal religious or spiritual affiliation, but who feel themselves in some way connected with those who have gone before. Many consider walking the Camino to have been a life-changing experience, and after returning home from the Camino, many Northern Europeans have started to lobby for the creation of pilgrim paths or spiritually meaningful trails in their own countries. This tendency particularly in areas where pilgrimage traditions were ruptured, had led to the contemporary phenomenon of communalization. Now, communalization is a clumsy but useful term for describing the process of introducing aspects of the Camino to other routes and pilgrimage sites, often now defunct. Among the main features of communalization are the ideas that real pilgrimage is done on foot, or at least by some form of slow travel, and that the journey is more important than the destination. There's also the material culture of the Camino, including the pilgrim passports and Compostela-like certificates, and ritual activities such as pilgrim blessings. The new Camino, based upon a preeminent medieval set of pilgrim routes, has transformed many people's views and understanding of pilgrimage. It has caused radical reappraisal of what pilgrimage might mean and might have to offer, particularly in contexts where traditions of pilgrimage were disrupted and discredited. And an excellent example of this is to be found in Scandinavia. Huge numbers of Scandinavians have been on Camino, and the development of new pilgrimage there has been heavily influenced by this. The, the Norwegian St. Olav's ways, in particular, have become enormously significant. And as you can see, it's not just me making the connection with the Camino. The focus of the Olav's ways is Nidaros Cathedral in Trondheim, the historic site of the shrine to the national saint, 
saint or liar. Now, pilgrimage in Norway really took off in the 1990s, and between 1994 and 97, a historical pilgrim path from Oslo Fontheim was identified as Weimar. However, between 2006 and 2010, the future of the way was reviewed, resulting in a really interesting organizational structure for pilgrimage, supported both by the Lutheran Church and the government including six regional pilgrimage centers and a national center to coordinate with other bodies such as Norwegian tourism and heritage authorities. And as you can see, the route of St. Olaf Ways, a network of routes through Denmark, Sweden and Norway, terminating at Nidaros Cathedral, became a Council of Europe cultural route in 2010. The Olaf Ways bear all the hallmarks of a communalized pilgrimage, such as a focus on long distance walking, branded way markers along a historical route, a pilgrim passport, and a certificate of completion. So on arrival at Nidaros Cathedral, there are directions to the pilgrim center where pilgrims will receive a warm welcome and their St. Olav's letter. The installation of pilgrim priests, pilgrim blessings, and pilgrim services at Nidaros are examples of the new accommodation for pilgrimage, some, somewhat anomalous for the Lutheran Church in the Reformed tradition. But as one of the officials at the Oslo Centre told me, this is really not about looking back to and recreating pilgrimage as it was in the past. It is new pilgrimage for new times. Solidly part of the communalization phenomenon in a Lutheran context, it's fascinating to see how pilgrimage itself is represented and represented, as for example here at the Oslo Center, where we see Jerusalem, Rome, Santiago de Compostela, alongside Luther's Wittenberg, Nidaros, and a popular Swedish pilgrimage site. Norway's Camino is very much about reflective journeying and walking with a purpose. The professionally produced leaflets for the St. Olav's Ways invite walkers to find yourself on the St. Olav's Laden Trail to Nidaros or find your way and find yourself, leaving no doubt that the focus of the journey is the pilgrim rather than St. Olav and that the journey holds the promise of being in some way personally transformational. And so we return to Canterbury. Some UK Camino pilgrims choose Canterbury as their official starting point, while in the wake of the Camino's success, the way marked Via Frantigena now retraces the historic route followed by Archbishop of Canterbury Sigurd in 990 from Canterbury to Rome and it too was designated a Council of Europe cultural route in 1994. A number of local pilgrim route related paths have developed in relation to Canterbury, such as the Pilgrim's Way from either London Southwark Cathedral or Winchester Cathedral to Canterbury. The Via Francigena passport, as well as the Pilgrim's Way passport, can be purchased and stamped at Canterbury, and self-identified pilgrims can get a pilgrim blessing there from Anglican clergy. So as once again, both a destination for pilgrims and a starting point for European pilgrimage, communalization is having an impact on how the cathedral projects itself and how it too has reevaluated its role and theological stance in relation to pilgrimage. So the appeal of roots with roots appears enormous as diverse people feel themselves to be spiritual heirs of a pilgrimage tradition largely seen through the lens of the comparatively recent representation of the Camino de Santiago de Compostela. Because so many people have found their feet as pilgrims on the Camino, 
it has become for many the exemplar of pilgrimage in the 21st century, which has spread elsewhere through communalization. But this new pilgrimage, though rooted in the past, is very much a product of the present. For Northern Europeans walking in the footsteps of pilgrims and this new representation of pilgrimage is providing an infrastructure for self-discovery and healing, for connectedness with oneself, with others, with nature, with the spiritual and with the past. And I've snuck in a route of Scotland there because a remarkable thing happened in 2017. In 2017, the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland endorsed a motion to rehabilitate pilgrimage as a genuine and meaningful spiritual pathway, officially to reverse the policy that has suppressed and discouraged pilgrimage since the Reformation. So now, even traditionally Presbyterian Scotland is rapidly becoming covered with new pilgrim trails. And this again is very much a legacy of the Camino. So one can only wonder what Luther, who is of course now himself the focus of a pilgrimage path, might make of all of this. And with that, we take a distinctly new direction and go to Kaisra, who will be talking about the Hajj. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Um, I'd just like to start actually very quickly by going and taking a look at what uh, the speakers have spoken about so far and actually um, it really made me think about Richard talking about the equality of pilgrims and it really of course is so resonant of Hajj as well um, and also discovering the gifts of others. Um, today there's about approximately three million Muslims that perform the Hajj so you're really reliant on that um, com uh, companionship. Um, and also really what Marion was talking about, the importance of the journey as well as the the shrine. It's um, the literal word Hajj means the journey to somewhere, to attend a journey. So it's the traveling to somewhere and it's also the intention to complete rituals. So very much a part of the Hajj as well. And it's nice to link those things together. Now, um, if I begin uh, with the Hajj, so we are taking a huge turn here. Um, but I'd start with looking at Mecca, what the Hajj is, and trying to explain a little bit, put it into a concept, put it within the landscape of what now is uh, modern day Saudi Arabia. So, oops. The city of Mecca is located in the region of the Hejaz in pr present day Sa Saudi Arabia, approximately 70 kilometers inland from the port of Jeddah, the main gateway to Mecca on the Red Sea. Within this city is situated the Masjid al-Haram, the sacred mosque, in a low valley between two mountain ranges. At the center of this mosque is the Kaaba, a name which reflects the building's cube-like shape. This is the most sacred sanctuary in Islam and the place where Muslims around the world direct their prayers at least five times a day. Mecca is the birthplace of the Prophet Muhammad and is known as Makkah al mukarrama Mecca the Noble. It is here that millions of Muslims from around the world converge every year, according to the lunar calendar, for Hajj, the annual pilgrimage and the fifth pillar of Islam. I will just mention uh, very quickly that the Hajj is the annual pilgrimage, but um, it is possible to do a smaller pilgrimage, what's called the lesser pilgrimage, the Umrah, can take place at any time during the year. Um, Muslims must perform the Hajj at least once in their lifetimes if they are able. And the Hajj involves a series of rites which begin within the Masjid al-Haram and culminate in three areas in the vicinity, Mount Arafat, Muzdalifa and Mina. Arafat by far being the most important of any of the pilgrimage stations. The rituals take place between the 8th and the 13th of the Hajj, the, the 12th month of the Islamic calendar, and all men and women, irrespective of sect, perform Hajj in exactly the same way. 
So the formalities of Hajj have remained unchanged since it was established in the 7th century, and the observance of it has taken place every year since. In times before coronavirus, some three million Muslims, as I mentioned, converged towards Mecca from all over the earth, making it one of the most remarkable religious gatherings in the world. Okay. So most people are familiar with the site of the Kaaba, which we can see here, um, the cube-like building. The, the word Kaaba really means cube. Um, here we can see it in a painting from the 16th century. Um, and in the center, the earliest photograph ever taken of the sanctuary. And here, as it was only just a few days ago um, on uh, makalive.net. Um, missing its characteristic busyness, obviously, because of social distancing. So the surroundings may have changed considerably, but the Kaaba, the focal point of the worship of one God, has remained unchanged for centuries. So what I'd like to do now is really talk about the origins of Hajj in light of the Thomas Beckett exhibition. I would like to address the commonalities of faith, and the one way to do this is through the prism of the patriarch Abraham. Um, So in the Islamic tradition, Ibrahim, Abraham of the Bible, occupies an important role as the founding father of monotheism, so much so that the Quran commands Muslims to follow Milit Ibrahim, the creed of Abraham. Consequently, at the heart of the Masjid al-Haram are three principal points, the Kaaba, the Well of Zamzam, and the Maqam Ibrahim, the station of Abraham, which are all associated with him. And we'll look at these in a moment. So the Quran testifies that it's Abraham who was first guided to the site of Mecca, as instructed to make it a place of purification, pilgrimage and sanctuary. And it's through the actions of Abraham, his son Ismail and the boy's mother Hagar, that Mecca becomes a place of peace and sanctity. In the Quran, it says, we showed Abraham the site of the house. Purify my house for those who circle around it, those who stand to pray and those who bow and prostrate themselves. It's further upon God's command that Abraham establishes the sacred building called the Kaaba, known to Muslims as Beit Allah, the house of God, as a focal point of the worship of one God and a center of pilgrimage. Abraham's status as the architect of the Kaaba, with the support of his son Ismail, is made pr prominently in the Quran, and Abraham's efforts to make the Kaaba a place of pilgrimage and pure monotheism are made clear in a number of key verses, such as the one that you can see here. Take the spot where Abraham stood as the place of prayer. This verse refers to the station of Abraham, which I mentioned, which is now commonly taken to test, signify the stone that bears the imprints of Abraham's feet, rendered as he built the Kaaba and is still in situ um, in, in, the, uh, in Mecca. This is situated within the sanctuary and was a place behind which the Prophet Muhammad prayed. The Quran calls it a sign to those who believe, instructing that those who are able to perform the pilgrimage are now duty bound to do so. The Quran says, pilgrimage to the house is a duty owed to God by people who are able to undertake it. Um, and here we see those three um, monuments to Abraham that I spoke about. We have um, the Kaaba, the Maqam Ibrahim, this is the, the big, uh, what we know now as, what we can see now as the big uh, brass um, uh, container. Within that now you can see a, a glass bell and the, the imprints of Abraham are is set within the base of that glass bell. You can see the man there peering in and looking at the, the, the feet, the imprints of the feet. Um, and to, the, to the, the bottom there we can see the building of Zamzam, the well of Zamzam. Um, and that's the water source available to pilgrims who visit Mecca um, and it's still used to this day. Um, I use an old picture here because it doesn't look like that anymore. It's entirely subterraneous now, but at some point um, until recently it was um, a building that you could access from uh, just very close by to the Kaaba. Um, so the rituals of Hajj are fairly complex um, and I will not go into them all but they all have very strong Abrahamic 
connections. For instance, those re reflecting uh, Zamzam, as I've mentioned, um, are regarding the occasion where Abraham leaves Hagar in the barren Mecca desert. And as she runs between the two famous hillocks of Safa and Marwa, she searches for water for her child Ismail. And this is one of the main rituals of Hajj, and of course is still reenacted today, a powerful symbol of the desperation of a mother and the fulfillment of her prayers. Many will be familiar with the rituals of the stoning of the three pillars at Minna. Here, pilgrims reenact the occasion of Abraham and Ismail pelting the devil with stones as he was trying to dissuade Abraham from conducting the ultimate sacrifice. Again, this occasion is reenacted still today at Minna, where pilgrims use this as a way of ousting the inner devil, a symbolic metaphor. And as a consequence of Abraham's obedience and endeavours, it is stated in the Quran that Abraham is given the special status and the endearing epithet Khalilallah, the most cherished friend of God. Not just a friend, he's the most cherished friend of God. And for this reason, Mecca is still known today as the city of Abraham. Um, and here, actually, um, we can see um, in the Ottoman period, again, not in the Saudi period, but just before in the Sa uh, Ottoman period, the Makam Ibrahim, where that the stone uh, imprint of Abraham's feet would have been, would have been kept in a building like this. The building was um, had closed doors, as we can see, and then um, on top of the imprints, there would be um, a metal casing, and on top of that casing, there would be a textile beautifully embroidered um, and decorated, such as the one that you can see here. So um, many prophets, um, sorry, uh, many prophets are of Islam are believed to have had a connection with Mecca, following on from what their ancestor Abraham was chosen to accomplish. But it is Muhammad, the final messenger of Islam, who establishes the rites of Hajj as it is still performed today. In the year 632, during what is known as the Farewell Hajj, Prophet Muhammad affirmed the rituals of Hajj, and it was on Mount Arafat that he gave his final sermon, his final message to all Muslims before his death. Thus, Abraham is the builder of the Kaaba, and it is Muhammad who establishes the rites to be performed there. Between them, they've established what today is one of the greatest pilgrimages on earth. Um, I don't have much time today, but I would like to talk very briefly um, about two other very important sites of non-compulsory pilgrimage for Muslims. The city of Medina is located approximately 280 miles north of Mecca, and although not part of the Hajj rituals, is a place all Muslims will strive to visit as part of their pilgrimage. Indeed, it is actively encouraged to do so. Formerly named Yathrib and known as Medina al Manawara, the radiant or enlightened city, it was host to the Prophet Muhammad where he fled, when he fled Mecca in 622. This moment is called the Hijra, the migration, um, and became and was the start of the new Islamic calendar. It's also where he is buried, and pilgrims will spend some days visiting the mosque in Medina, calling upon the grave of Muhammad, where they will pay their respects with greetings and prayers. Two of the closest companions of Muhammad, Abu Bakr and Umar al ibn al Khattab, are also buried in his burial chamber, over which is the mosque's iconic green dome. Um, and, uh, oops, we've gone back. Sorry. Um, this is what we can see here in the painting in the back. You can see the green dome. So going back to the topic of saints, here we see um, a Muslim saint, Mia Mir, praying in Medina, a saint of particular importance in the Asian subcontinent. Although he never actually visited Medina, the external space is replaced by inner spirituality. Here the saint is not able to pray in the Prophet's mosque, but is otherwise present there within his own soul. And this is what the painter is trying to depict here. And of course, Jerusalem. And Anthony mentioned Jerusalem and he mentioned Margaret being traumatized by the event of Jerusalem falling. Um, the, um, the alternate here is that, um, of course, the Muslims would have celebrated the opportunity to be able to perform their own pilgrimage there. And of course, Jerusalem here can be seen alongside images of Mecca and Medina. 
pilgrims would make the effort to travel to Jerusalem if they could en route to Mecca. Very briefly, Jerusalem was the original direction of the prayer before Mecca, the place associated with the Prophet's famous nocturnal journey, the Isra and Mirage, and it's also considered significant due to the fact that it was a domicile of many ancient prophets and saints, important too in the Islamic tradition. So I just wanted to go back now um, to uh, the exhibition itself. And um, I just wanted to spend a few minutes um, looking at Mecca at the time of Thomas Beckett. So when Beckett was nominated as Archbishop of Canterbury in 1162, Mecca was ruled by local rulers who claimed the title of Sharif, Sharif of Mecca. The Sharif would have played to ruling dynasties on the Fatimid and Abbasid sides in Cairo and Baghdad, so they would pledge allegiance to whoever was most uh, powerful at the time. And it's from the Abbasids that the cover of the Kaaba was fashioned in black. In 1169, a year before Beckett's death, I believe, um, a new Ayyubid Sultanate established itself in Cairo, taking over from the Fatimids. And as the Sultanate extended its control over Yemen, Mecca fell within the scope of Egypt. And it's Saladin, of course, Saladin, and uh, Anthony mentioned this also, who proclaims his, his, proclaims his political authority by having coins minted in his name and claiming the title Hadim al Haramain al Sharifain, custodian of the two holy sanctuaries, a title which would later be used by most rulers of the holy sanctuary of Mecca and is still used today by the House of Saud. It's also around this time that one of the earliest travelogues of the Hajj by Ibn Jubair was written. He went on Hajj in 1183, um, so a few years after the death of Beckett, and it remains one of the most important early accounts. Ibn Jubair, who was born in 1143, lived in Spain and set out on the Hajj by crossing the Mediterranean to Sicily and then on to Cairo. On the way, he visited Jerusalem during the Crusades, which was at this time ruled by Saladin, of course. His account is lively and observant, and he captures life beautifully during a time of great warfare and great challenge, uh, change. Um, I'd just like to read quickly um, an interesting quote from um, the, uh, the travelogue of Ibn Jubair. He says, one of the astonishing things that is talked of is that through the fires of discord burned between the two parties, Muslim and Christian, two armies of them may meet and dispose themselves in battle array, and yet Muslims and Christian travellers will come and go between them without interference. In this connection, we saw at this time, that is in the month of Jumad al-Ula, the departure of Saladin with all the Muslim troops to lay siege to the fortress of Kerak, one of the greatest of the Christian strongholds, lying astride the Hijaz roll and hindering the overland passage of the Muslims. Between it and Jerusalem lies a one day's journey or a little more, it occupies the choicest part of the land in Palestine and has a very wide dominion with continuous settlements, it being said that the number of villages reaching 400. This sultan invested it and put it to sore straits and long the siege lasted. But still the caravans passed successively from Egypt to Damascus going through the lands of the Franks without impediment from them. In the same way, the Muslims continuously journeyed from Damascus to Acre through Frankish territory, and likewise, not one of the Christian merchants was stopped or hindered in Muslim territories. The Christians impose a tax on the Muslims in their land, which gives them full security, and likewise, the Christian merchants pay a tax upon their goods in Muslim lands. Agreements exist between them, and there is equal treatment in all cases. The soldiers engage themselves in their war while the people are at peace, and the world goes to him who conquers. So the annual caravans would set out from the great cities of the Islamic world, as Anthony mentioned also, Damascus, Cairo, Baghdad. And during this time, the great convoys would be led by an Amir al-Hajj, the lead of the caravan, along with a retinue of soldiers, guides, service staff and countless others, along with Muslims of all social classes, travelling along the well-known routes, which service the pilgrims with stops for food, water and shelter. The Hajj was a major incentive to travel and had huge impact upon trade and migration, as well as a great exchange of ideas and knowledge across land and water routes of Asia, Africa and parts of Europe. So the Hajj has always been a great gathering of the world's Muslims and still is today. Um, so now, um, having covered Hajj, um, I pass you on to Imma Ramos, who will talk about pilgrimage in colonial Bengal. Thank you so much. 
So uh, my presentation today is going to explore the significance of Hindu pilgrimage souvenirs that circulated in Bengal during the late 19th century under British rule. Um, so I'm just waiting for my PowerPoint, brilliant. Uh, so one of the most popular subjects of these souvenirs uh, produced in the colonial capital of Calcutta in the form of watercolour paintings and lithographs was the story of the Hindu goddess Sati, whose body, according to early mythological texts, was dismembered and distributed across India. I will explore the reasons why the subject was chosen for illustration during the British occupation and how these images visually articulated the rhetoric of sacrifice or the motherland. These images were intended as souvenirs for pilgrims to the city's Kaligat temple, which was said to enshrine Sati's sacred remnants. Together, they contributed to resurrecting the myth of Sati's fragmented body as an icon of cultural crisis and territorial consciousness. The earliest known illustration of the Sati myth appeared around the turn of the 19th century in this anonymous miniature painting, but the myth itself dates back to before the 10th century. It's probable that the myth was not depicted for many centuries because it's a narrative of suffering, a theme not usually present in Hindu devotional iconography. We find versions of the story of Sati in the Kalika Puran and the Devi Bhagavad Puran which are religious texts devoted to the veneration of the divine feminine or Shakti, dated to around the 10th and 11th centuries, respectively. According to these versions, Sati's father, King Daksha, did not invite her husband, Shiva, to his yajna, a ceremonial sacrifice during which oblations are poured into a ritual fire. Humiliated by this act of disrespect, Sati performed self-immolation. The distraught Shiva retrieved her body and began to dance with it in his arms across the cosmos. His grief risked the destruction of the world, so Vishnu, god of preservation, who you can see just to the left of Shiva, threw his discus and cut Sati's body into pieces, which were scattered across the subcontinent. From the 7th century onwards, a network of shaktipits, or seats of power, was established to enshrine each piece of the goddess. Modern imaginings of the myth often focus on the detailed classification of these body parts and which temple or location they correspond to, as in this contemporary print. At many of the sites, particularly those in Bengal, the representation of Shiva carrying Sati functions as a visual reminder of their dedication to Sati's relics, as at Nalhati, home of Sati's vocal pipe. Here you can see a contemporary relief near the Nalhati shrine. Before devotees reach Fulara Atahas temple in Birbhum, a gate commissioned in 2001 welcomes them. Sati and Shiva appear at the top, while 51 panels all around classify each body part and its location. The temples, however, are dedicated not only to Sati's relics, but to local goddesses as well. At Nalhati, the local goddess is Kalika Devi, and you can see her murti, or divinely embodied icon, on the left here. And at Fulara Atahas, the goddess enshrined is Fulara Devi, this mound is also simultaneously believed to be Sati's lower lip. Many of these temples, in fact, were originally associated with various non-Vedic goddesses, and the Shakti Beats may have been conceived as a way to legitimize and integrate these local goddesses into the orthodox Hindu pantheon. These shrines thus articulate the paradox that the goddess is both formless and unified as Sati, and form bound in her manifestation as a local goddess. Since Sati's relics are often either concealed from view or take the form of a rough, uncarved stone, devotees frequently focus their devotion on the murti of the local goddess. 
Today, it's commonly accepted that there are 51 Shakti Beats across South Asia. Kaliga was acknowledged as a Shakti Beat from at least the 15th century when a devotee received a vision of the goddess Kali telling him that the toes of Sati were buried on that spot. The building consists of one large room, the inner sanctum, surrounded by an elevated circumambulatory balcony. The Kali Murti is in full view as devotees circle around it. You can see it here. It was created in the 19th century to contain Sati's toes. It consists primarily of a face with a large golden tongue held in place by an upper row of golden teeth, four hands and feet. The prominence of the latter is an apt reference to Sati's toes, as well as an indication of the pilgrim's desire to touch the feet of the goddess. Sati's toes in the form of a stone are said to be kept inside a box below the muddi. Kaligat Temple is a significant site of pilgrimage. The Sanskrit word for place of pilgrimage is Tirta, which means to cross over, that is to make a transition to the divine. However, Kaligat and other sites dedicated to Sati's remains are known as bits or seats, stressing the rootedness of the goddess, whose power is firmly grounded in the earth itself. The hundreds of pilgrimage sites across India created a network that was hugely significant in the construction of territorial consciousness. The Sati sites, which linked together all the corners of India, expressed a world view in which the earth was considered sacred and the goddess embodied herself in earthly form. Together, they formed a powerful pilgrimage network that affirmed the notion that the subcontinent itself was a goddess. When pilgrims reach Kaligat Temple today, they carry out rites that enable them to achieve a state of communion with the divine. Clockwise circumambulation around the sacred muddi is a habitual observance. They approach the goddess for the granting of health, procreation, longevity, protection from danger and enlightenment. To experience darshan or sacred vision of the muddi is the ultimate objective of pilgrimage, involving seeing and being seen by the deity in a reciprocal act of visual communion. For pilgrims in the 19th century, souvenirs such as the paintings and prints of Sati sold at Kaligat Temple extended and preserved the religious experience at Calcutta's most famous site of worship. One could have the experience of Darshan, not only of the temple Murti, but also of the souvenir itself, which retained the religious potency of the site and reminded devotees of its association with Sati. Kaligat souvenirs in the form of watercolour paintings peaked in popularity from the 1850s to the 1880s. They were made by former village scroll painters who used to travel from place to place singing stories from the Hindu epics depicted on the paintings during village gatherings and festivals. The painters offered watercolour souvenirs that portrayed a variety of subjects, including the temple's Kali icon, but one of the chief subjects of the Kaligat paintings was the Sati myth. In portraying this myth, pilgrimage souvenirs were taking on a subject fraught with both spiritual and political meaning. According to Hindu belief, the Shakti beats were animated by Sati's divine presence. Through her dismemberment, the Shakti or power in her body was distributed across the subcontinent, stressing her relationship to the earth. Bengali writers, artists and intellectuals responded to the myth by reformulating and resurrecting her into a more powerful body, India itself. The 19th century increase in the story's popularity suggested to some that the concept of the subcontinent representing the body of the goddess was a manifestation of a pre-colonial sense of national unity. They thus contested claims by figures such as the British administrator John Strachey that, quote, there is not and never was in India, or by a European school teacher who told the future Bengali writer Udav Mukhopadhyay 
that, quote, patriotism was unknown to the Hindus. For Buddha, the Sati myth showed that, quote, the entire motherland is in truth the person of the deity. As Sati's fragmented body was multiplied and distributed across the subcontinent, so was her power. For Buddha, the shrines formed a network that transformed each individual act of devotion into a collective reverence for India itself. Aurobindo Ghosh, one of the leaders of the Swadeshi or self-sufficiency movement that arose to contest British power, published a rousing 1908 article for the Bandimataram newspaper entitled The Parable of Sati. In it, he reinterpreted the story in terms of the contemporary political struggle in India, with Sati representing the Indian nation and Shiva India's destiny. For now, their union had been frustrated. Sati had left her old body and men said she was dead. But she was not dead, only withdrawn from the eyes of men, and the gods clove the body of Sati into pieces so that it was scattered all over India. For Sati will be born again on the high mountains of mighty endeavour, colossal aspiration, unparalleled self-sacrifice, she will be born again in a better and more beautiful body. Sati shall wed Shiva that the national life of India shall meet and possess its mighty destiny. Here Aurobindo interprets the distribution of her body as a symbol for national regeneration. The enduring appeal of the Sati and Shiva image of pathos displayed in the Kaligat souvenirs would lead to its iconographic consistency right up until the present day in the form of contemporary prints, sculptures, monuments, and even film. Oops. This TV series from 2011 um, really stressed Sati's relationship to the earth by um, giving it a very dramatic cosmic dimension. So Shiva is shown carrying her, hovering above the planet. And when Vishnu's chakra um, strikes the goddess's corpse, 51 fireballs representing 51 elements of her body hurtle towards different parts of the subcontinent, um, engendering the Shakti beats. In late 19th century Bengal, souvenirs of Sati offered pilgrims a way to extend, relive and remember their experience at the Kaligat temple by bringing an image of Sati back with them to their homes. Through souvenirs, the network of physical sites became a network of printed and painted images that was broadly dispersed across Bengal and the rest of India. A souvenir of Sati sold at Kaligat was an image of remembrance reminding devotees that the temple represented one piece of a vast network of sites that stretched across the subcontinent and together made up the body of the goddess. Thank you very much. And now it's back to Anthony to chair the Q&A. Thank you so much, Emma, and thank you all the speakers. Um, for your wonderful presentations. Um, we've got about 10 minutes um, for some questions and some discussion. Um, and we have had a huge number of um, some very big questions, some very specific questions. We've tried to answer the specific ones in the Zoom chat. Um, we've had a lot of questions about the definition of pilgrimage. Um, and Marion talked a couple of times about walking with intent. I'm going to put each of the speakers on the spot now because we haven't got much time. I'm going to ask them each for their one sentence definition of pilgrimage. Um, and I will start by offering a journey motivated by religion with a fixed destination. Um, does uh, Richard, do you want to offer your definition? I, I'd say it was a a transformative journey that becomes a rites of passage within your life in which you seek a spiritual meaning for your life. Great. Marianne, do you have a definition for us? I think there's a lot to be said for walking with intent. And I do agree with Richard that transformation is very much a feature of that. But of course, we can have transformational moments 
for me up the top of a mountain as well as in a formal pilgrimage setting. So I think it's hard to pin it down only to specific contexts. Okay, thanks. Sir. This is a very difficult question, and I'm afraid I'm going to have to be very literal about it and assume that everyone um, uh, has a spiritual fulfillment by going on pilgrimage, whichever pilgrimage it is. Um, the Hajj literally means a few things. It means effort, so there has to be effort, and it is effort. Um, it's the, the attending to a journey, it's travelling on a journey. So even if, for example, you die on the journey, then your intention to reach an end place means that you fulfil the criteria. Um, and it's also the performance or the intention to perform those rituals. Um, so it's a combination of those three things, I'd say. Great, thank you. And Emma, sorry to put you on the spot just after you presented. Uh, do you have a one sentence definition of pilgrimage for us? Um, uh, well, actually, I mean, uh, I probably um, repeat something that I said in the presentation in that the the, the Sanskrit word for a place of pilgrimage is um, this word tirta, which mean, it literally means to cross over. Um, so making that like a, a transition from perhaps a worldly realm to a divine realm. So I think that's a that's a nice way of putting it. Great, thank you. So I'm going to ask now a related question which Catherine Banning has asked, but it's it's similar to several questions that people have asked. And Catherine asks, do we see parallels between significant faith pilgrimages and common contemporary journeys made today for fans of mass media such as novels or films or even video games? Is there a valid comparison between secular pilgrimage, what might be called secular pilgrimage today, and pilgrimages of faith? And perhaps that Marion or Richard, their questions for you, because they're things you touched on in your presentations. I think um, what we're undoubtedly seeing, uh, whether it's satisfactory pe to people or not, is there's immense elasticity in how the whole idea of pilgrimage is being used and actually quite often a crossover between different sorts of meaningful journeying and I guess although I spoke earlier of walking with intent in the Camino context meaningful journeying because for many pilgrims in various traditions it's not how you get there it is being at the special or meaningful place people often do not care how someone gets to glastonbury or lourdes or whatever the important thing is to be there so i think this idea of meaningful journeying has some potency because the behavior for example that you can see at graceland in many ways replicates that of pilgrimage sites some people would be horrified to call that pilgrimage. For others, it's how they describe their journey. Uh, no, I, I, I'd agree that the important thing is that, you know, like, like secular pilgrimage, perhaps you're going towards a place because you've heard about it and it's exciting, it's a holy place or it's a famous place and you're going in search maybe of a holy person or a celebrity. But the important thing is, is the transformation that takes place within you and in your interaction with those on the journey with you. So in fact, um, the person on the journey becomes the gift to the people he goes to. It's not just going in search of a celebrity. You yourself can become the gift to the place where you go. And that's what reverses celebrity in many ways. And I think though, even with those more, what we might say secular pilgrimages, it's exactly that companionship, the camaraderie, the sharing with others comes through. That connects to another strand of questions um, really about pilgrimage as social action. Um, Leah Stuttard asks Richard how he thinks pilgrimage can help to foster social action, but in a very different vein, there's a question for um, Ima about um, have, um, how have Hindu temples been politicized, for instance, as symbols of protest against foreign imperialists. 
Um, and so I wondered, I mean, they're, they're, they're quite different questions, but thinking about the social life of pilgrimage, the social action of pilgrimage, the politicization of pilgrimage. I wonder if, Emma, you wanted to respond to that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, absolutely. Um, sites, uh, many temples in Bengal, particularly the Shaktabid sites, did become um, revolutionary symbols uh, of Mother India, essentially, during um, colonial rule. So um, at Kaligat um, temple that I was talking about, the local goddess within that shrine is Kali. Uh, now, during the late 19th century, uh, Kali herself becomes uh, a symbol of India rising up against the British because she's quite a fierce goddess. She's um, she's shown sort of um, with, with heads around her neck, um, which are actually symbols of the ego, but the British interpret those heads as um, British heads that she, so there's a sort of a fear and a paranoia around her from the, from the British side, and Bengali revolutionaries take advantage of that fear and paranoia. And so you have lots of um, temples around Bengal, which was the, the center of British rule, um, that become these revolutionary sites for resistance. So many Bengali revolutionaries went to the Kaligat temple to offer their um, services and sacrifice to end colonial rule. So Kali becomes this very um, radical force during that time. Um, perhaps I should hand over now. I mean, in lots of ways that what you've just said in a maps on very clearly some of the stuff I work on in the Middle Ages about the spatial and social politics of pilgrimage sites trying to be used in moments of conflict. Um, Richard, sorry, do you want to talk about the pilgrimage's social action? I think it is the most wonderful social action because it, you know, often social action is transactional. In other words, you know, someone who has um, riches bestows them on someone who is poor. But in in pilgrimage, it, it's completely reciprocal. The guest becomes the host, and the host becomes the guest. And in meeting one another, you, you cross the boundaries which usually divide. Pilgrimage is really an experience of being with other people. And uh, especially in our modern age, where, where it's so easy to become caught in your own social um, category, um, pilgrimage really is a way of, of learning to listen to other people and, and being with people from all different um, situations and lives um, with all different kinds of life stories. So it, it has that, that kind of real um, unity and, and uh, equality about it. Okay, thank you. A few people also ask questions about um, non-religious, other earlier histories of non-religious pilgrimages and whether paganism has a uh, has histories of pilgrimage. And I just, I, given that we're running out of time, I'd say some of the sites I work on were clearly holy wells or healing wells or holy mountains, holy trees, long before Christianity say, came to the British Isles. And so often there was a local pilgrimage site, which then gets where then religion maps onto. And we know that in say on the on the Camino um, or on the approach to Jerusalem, certain mountains or corners or springs themselves become um, holy sites. And I mentioned the shrine of Saint Foya Conk, that itself was one of the places on the Camino to Santiago, which became a, in itself its own great pilgrimage site. Okay, um, we were supposed to finish at seven, so I think we should draw things to a close there. There are so many great questions, so many points for discussion. I think that's testament to the wonderful richness of the presentations that we've that we've heard, which have one of the concepts that was very common in the Middle Ages was mental pilgrimage, or sometimes called virtual pilgrimage or armchair pilgrimage, where one was transported in one's mind to many different places. And the presentations this evening have really done that for us. They've taken us all over the world. And also it's wonderful that we've been joined by people from all over the world this evening. Um, so thank you all um, as members of the audience for joining us. Thank you to the British Museum and the Open University for supporting this event. And thank you to all the speakers for their fascinating um, and very varied presentations. Um, do look out for other related um, events coming up at the British Museum. 
And if you're lucky enough to have tickets for the Beckett, Beckett exhibition and able to see it, do enjoy it. It's absolutely wonderful. So we'll come to a close there. Um, thank you all so much and good evening. Goodbye.